This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. Common sense isn't common practice. In fact, success in most sports, business, and life doesn't come from doing something crazily fantastic or different, but from just getting all of the basics perfect and improving every day. Welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast, where today we have the gold medal Olympian Ben Hunt Davis on the show. What I love about Ben and his story is that he completely embodies the growth mindset. Ben was an average rower when he started and managed to get to an elite level and didn't even get into his school team. And even when he did manage to get to an elite level, he still carried on losing all international competitions he entered. In fact, he lost every single international rowing event he was in until the very end of his career, where he fully acknowledged his physical limitations and focused on learning and improving on anything that he could as well as his physical fitness. And with his team, they turned their luck around and went on to seize the gold medal at the Olympics by accepting their limitations and working with them. Ben now runs a coaching company and has written a best-selling book called Will It Make the Boat Go Faster? And he is a brilliantly motivational and humble man. The interview is just truly epic and I know you're going to get loads from it, so I can't wait for you to listen to it. We start by talking about maturity of all things and trying to get your head together as a young person and the difficulties actually as an athlete trying to do something so hard as win a gold when you're so young. And this really moves into the conversation of how to take ownership and just improve yourself and be responsible for your own outcomes in life. And enjoy the show. Let's say you hit your Olympics at a peak between 30 and 40 as humans. Do you think a lot more people would have like the potential that because of it's at like 20 to 30? There's loads of people never actually realize that they would have the option because they sort of have lost in getting drunk and things. That's quite a good question because I think that if you're a female gymnast, your peak is 16, mm. 20 or something. If you're a female swimmer, it's kind of similar. I think I was lucky in that as a rower, I didn't have to take it seriously until I was 16. There are rowers who start at 20 and become Olympic champions where you're a whole lot more mature than you are as a teenager. And I think probably the younger you have to go through everything, probably the harder it is. Maybe you get more parent parental support. And I think there are lots of people who have got a whole lot of natural physical ability, but at whatever age, they don't want it. They're not hungry. And that's a critical part. Never quite like realized quite how much you can kind of do anything. So if I put myself through some tests and sort of worked out what my like natural physical ability was, and I actually had 10 years to sort of put into it, like I feel like we'd be able to like focus and sort of become like a champion or something. But I'm 30, so oh, oh, it doesn't matter. So it's not really a chance anymore. But it took me almost 30 years to sort of work out that if you put focus into something, you'll get there. But do you think like at 20, you just maybe haven't realized that? Or So I think at 20, I was willing to work hard. I was very, very happy to train my ass off. And being down at the training centre at Leander Club in Henley was a great environment where it was easy to work hard. And I thought then that working hard was the answer. If I worked hard enough, it would be all right, rather than if I learned fast. And the change that happened in the last two years of my rowing career was, was the learning bit, where we were just ruthless about making sure we were learning from every session rather than just working hard. And I wish I had started learning earlier in my rowing career. Yeah, because there's like the 10,000 hour rule isn't quite a 10,000 hour rule. It's definitely like 10,000 hour of like deliberate practice rule uh, where you yeah. just always think about what's the hardest thing you can be doing and learning the most from. Yeah. And, and he, he doesn't say it's just 10,000 hours. It's a purposeful practice. And I think so often if we work hard at what we're doing and whatever job we're doing, we'll get better, which isn't necessarily the case. We just reinforce the habits we've got. And actually purposely right. thinking this week, what am I going to improve? And reviewing it and going, did that work? Did that not? So as a rower, then what was the things that you were missing by just regularly rowing compared to when you then changed your mindset to try and learn? What were like the things that you picked up on? The first seven years, basically, we did exactly what the coach told us to do. And the coach, a guy called Jürgen Grobler, who was coach cruise to win Olympic gold medals in 72, 76, 80, 88, 92, 96, 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016. He's quite good. 
And his program clearly works. It's incredible. Jürgen ran an incredibly successful program. It just didn't work for us. We weren't good enough physically to get it to work for us. When we moved training center to set up our own base, probably 75, 80% of the training that we did was Jürgen's program, maybe more. But we approached it pretty differently. Before every session, we'd get together and go, specifically, what are we trying to achieve this session? And in order to achieve that, what are the changes we need to make? And so when we talk about rhythm, let's be really, really clear, specifically, what do we mean and which bit of it we're trying to change? And we'd have proper detailed conversations, getting granular about the ingredients that go into whatever it was we were working on, so we could then have a chance to prove. Rather than beforehand going, right, it's 20K, we'll do 20 kilometers, 18 strokes a minute, off you go. That's just a physical session. It's got nothing to do with improving rowing technique. What we needed to do was we needed to be physically as good as we could be. Technically, we wanted to be the best crew in the world. And we wanted to be the most resilient group. And we wanted to be the best team. Did it take losing a few times to work out that you just physically were never going to be able to be the best? We were losing a lot of times. I lost a lot. And it took a bit of time to work out. But actually, just training harder wasn't going to work out. Generally, we learn stuff when we're ready to learn it. Would I be an open mind to learn it two years earlier, four years earlier? I don't know. Maybe the opportunity wasn't there. Maybe people weren't talking to me about it. Maybe it was all right there in front of me, but I chose just to work harder. All the stuff about growth mindset, about continuous improvement, about the theory behind it is all really, really simple common sense. But common sense isn't common practice, and it's actually really hard to do. Reviewing every single thing, every single session you do, meeting you come out of, what worked, what didn't, what do I do better tomorrow? It's actually quite hard to do. So I think the first thing to do is always to go, okay, so what worked? Mm. What was I really good at? What did I do really well? Because firstly, you need to know what you're good at so you can repeat it. If always you're coming out going, oh, what didn't work so well, then you're not kind of shining a light on the stuff that you need to keep repeating. You're just yeah. looking at the stuff that's not so good. So for us, it was really important to start with what was good, what worked well, what did I do well, what did we do well, what, whatever the question is, to highlight actually what you are good at, to make sure you can keep repeating it. And also, it then builds belief. Because you've got this whole load of stuff that actually we are really good at, and then you're going to pick holes in the stuff you're not so good at. And, and what do we do differently next time? So let's actually just continue to develop the strengths. Or it might be, let's work on the weaknesses. Who knows? You know, it gives you a whole lot of choices. And I think being aware of both is really important. Mm -hmm. And presumably with most of us in our roles of whatever we do, whether it be in sport or work, presumably we do most of it pretty well, because if not, we wouldn't be doing it. So if we were just to focus on getting better at the things we're good at, it would make a reasonable impact. I think you've also got to be aware of the bits you're rubbish at. So you should have a choice of, you know, which end of the spectrum do you work on? That's very logical. And yes, not the most common practice. It was all will it make the boat go faster, which is what led to the title of your book. The whole time we were asking ourselves in the crew, you know, what are you going to do? Is it going to make the boat go faster? Doing this, will it make the boat go faster? Doing that. Because we couldn't control winning. All we could do was control boat speed. So therefore, boat speed was the most important thing. So therefore, we had to do stuff that would make the boat go faster. Yeah, these things sort of seem to work with anything, like whether you're just doing like learning an instrument, business, relationships and stuff. The thinking should apply. Have you ever applied it to your relationships and things? Or does it come across a bit calculated when you're like, oh, this date didn't go so well. Like, <laughs> let's assess what worked. Okay, well, what didn't work? <laughs> Doing it in a formal way with my wife doesn't work. I don't necessarily do it in such a formalized way at home. But I absolutely do. Because there are conversations we have that work and there are conversations we don't. And when they don't, I want to try and Why? do it better next time. And if we've had a great evening as a family sitting around the dinner table, then... You know, I want to try and make sure... That you can recreate it. We recreate it, yeah. I've got to try and approach that situation differently. Getting to the evening going, what a great day we had. How do we manage to make it work so well? How do we manage to advise my daughter actually so she listened? How do we do that again? Because it's quite hard to do. It seems a bit wrong to be like analytical about things, but it's actually really good. But why not? Relationships. Why wouldn't you? Because, you know, there are certain things I know that will piss my daughters off and close them down. And if I'm not aware of what those things are, then I'll continue to piss them off and close them down and have a shit relationship. Whereas if I actually want to be a good husband and a good father, why wouldn't I want to try and learn from my mistakes and learn from what, you know, the few little bits that I do reasonably well? I think it kind of should apply to life everywhere. Yeah. Cool. I've definitely enjoyed this sort of discussion area. You then eventually managed to win the gold having done this. How did that feel? Quite good. Did you feel like you completely deserved it? We deserve it. It's an interesting question. So it depends what you mean by deserve. 
So we had trained as hard or harder than anyone else. We had put in the hours the same as anyone else. Why should somebody else deserve it over us? Sitting there from a space of going, we deserve it, you know, I've done nothing and I deserve to win is utter rubbish. But sitting on the start line, everybody was sitting there up for it. We had five crews alongside, one on one side and four on the other side. We'd done as much or more, who knows, as anyone. Why didn't we deserve Mm. it? And it was incredible. I was in the national team nine years and the very first race I won was 15 weeks before the Olympic final, which means I lost everything else I did. Wow. <laughs> and to finally get it right. And the last two years were different. The last two years, we actually came second in everything we did. The year of the Sydney Olympics, we came second in the first race and we won the next three. You know, losing heats and stuff along the way, but we won the races of the finals at Henley Royal Regatta, 13 weeks, 12 weeks, four. I can't remember how long we, we lost there. But we won the two big reactors leading out the Olympics. So sitting there, yeah, we were confident. And yeah, we had deserved it as much as anyone else. The World Championships here before we came second. Uh, we rode a pretty good race. Had, had to beat the Americans. And as it was at the end where we thought we had changed gear and pissed off and beat them, they changed gear and pissed off and beat us. And they were just better than us. The year of the Sydney Olympics, the first regatta we messed up in the final and we came second behind the Croatians. And that was kind of fair enough. Vienna, we rode... Actually, not that well, but we beat everybody. Lucerne, we, with a reserve on board, we rode pretty damn well and we beat everybody. In the heat of the Olympics, we lost to the Aussies. We rode really badly and we lost to them. I think they would say if you rode the race 100 times, they would win it 80% of the time or something. Yeah. And we would say the same thing. They'd beaten us twice that year. We beat them twice that year. And then it was all on the line in the Olympic final. We knew that when we rode well, we were really, really fast. And on that day, we rode really, really well. And we laid down every single drop of passion, aggression, and energy with the techniques that we'd worked so hard on. And we put together, for us, a perfect race. Nice. Well, obviously, congratulations. It was a good day at the office. What do you think would have happened in the rest of your life if you hadn't won? Because you technically still have all the same lessons from, like, will it make the boat go faster and stuff, but you think you'd have been able to, like, write that book? I came away from the Olympics, being in the national team for nine years and having won the Olympics. And I then started trying to work out what the hell to do next. I thought, ah, oh, maybe some sort of corporate training. I didn't really know what it was, but maybe that would be interesting. And I called all sorts of people. And when I said, I've come back from the Olympics, I won. Everyone was happy to talk to me. I eventually found somebody who was happy to talk to me and then actually give me a job. But if I had have come back and said, oh, well, I came seventh again, not many people would have spoken to me. And you know, I do a lot of speeches these days. And for me to stand up and tell a great story about how we came seventh, not many people would want to listen to. People want to hear from somebody who's won rather than a loser. And also, if I had have lost again, I wonder whether I'd be quite bitter. Having put 9, 10, 11, depending on how you count it, my life into it, if I had have just lost everything, I think I might be I might be quite bitter about stuff. It's a bit of a danger because if you want to be really inspiring to like maybe like kids and make them sort of follow their dreams in the Olympics, but also... You could like waste 10 years of someone's life if they only ever come like fourth and fifth or something and they never really have anything to write home about and then they just focus on stuff and maybe they could have had a great career doing something else that they've missed out on. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's a massive risk. Yeah. You know, you've got to put yourself out there to have a go and who knows how well you do it. And also it depends on expectations. If you come back from the Olympics having come 27th in the marathon, got a personal mm. best, yeah. you should be delighted. Our expectations were that we could be fast enough to win. And therefore, that became all-consuming, and the result was about winning. For some people, you know, really high expectations about competing and coming home with a kit. And that's fine. We all compete at our different levels, but there's a massive risk involved to all this stuff. If you want to achieve whatever your dream is, then you've got to put yourself out there. And I don't know how balanced I would be if I had have just put my heart and soul into everything and lost everything I ever did. I may not be that balanced or happy. So thank God I did. At what point of stage in your life were you then? Had you met like your wife? Had you already started having children? We got engaged 15, 18 months before the Olympics. And we planned to get married three weeks afterwards. Yeah. So I had quite a big month. I can't remember looking at me like, oh, that sounds like a really nice year. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, so came back from the Olympics, had a week. So my wife's half Italian, so we got married in Italy. Came back from the Olympics, had a week in England. I went out to Italy. Is that right? I think a week in England. And then I think I went out to Italy for a week and then got married. So three weeks after the final, I think. I think that's right. So a week in Australia after racing for the rest of the Olympics. week in England, going out, having fun, seeing friends, family, getting pissed. Mm. Then a week in Italy, vaguely trying to help 
preparations, although my mother in law had done it all then. We got married. Then we went backpacking for three months, I think. Backpacking around India, Nepal, Tibet. Came back. My wife was pregnant. I had no job. We were living with my dad. <laughs> and it was time to kind of grow up and get on with life. Yeah, and it's funny because you think like someone that wins a gold medal is probably knowing what they're doing with their life. But I had no plan past yeah. my wedding day. I thought that I'd stopped competing after Sydney. And as soon as I crossed the line, I knew that was it. But what came next? I had no idea. And at that point, I was 28. I'd never had a job. I had no qualifications. I dropped out of two university courses. If I had have lost, then I really did would have nothing going for me. Having won, I had something going for me. I had to kind of get on with it. And I came back and worked pretty hard and getting a job. And it took five months to find a job. And, and then I got on with the next thing. It's really important, like, if you want to do something sort of like public speaking and stuff, they say you should always have a story to tell. But that's obviously winning an Olympic medal is a pretty good story. But do you think you maybe could have worked out a different story if you had one of these with coaching? So I didn't want to tell a story. I didn't want to do speeches. I joined a training company called SI Group and we call ourselves performance coaches. We ran these training courses, these mindset behavior change training courses. And then there were a few people who did speeches who weren't sports people. They just did speeches about mindset. And they were really good at that. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a, what we call ourselves, coach, which was effectively running training sessions. And there were some groups I spent probably eight days with those spread over a number of months. And by the time I'd finished these six or eight days with them, they would think that I was an enthusiastic rower, but they wouldn't know anything about the fact that I'd been to the Olympics or not because I just didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to be good at the job for being good at the job rather than what I'd done before. Yeah. All the other coaches I worked with, there were 15 or so in the company. None of them are sports people. Mm. They all had come from different business backgrounds, and they were just really, really credible and good because they were good. And yeah. I wanted to be credible and good at doing my job because I was credible and good, not because I had a history behind me. Makes sense to like not to have the easy option to kind of build like your whole base to then sort of be able to work on that and grow it. So yeah. back to like your original like what worked, what didn't work kind of thing. It sort of it would have worked if you'd said like. I'm an Olympian, but then you'd never have got that far because you'd always been too weak in the other aspects. You wouldn't be able to like live on everything. Uh, we we had these you know, see these training course. Knowing the content was obviously really important. Being able to kind of challenge and coach and facilitate was important. Being able to entertain and engage people was really important. The kind of presentation style. There were loads of bits that I just wanted to be. It was a great environment for me, actually, because I was, you know, I'm quite competitive. And I went into this place and there were, say, 15 or so other coaches. And they were all really good. And I was rubbish. It was very clear. I knew nothing. And my competitive instinct came out. But rather than trying to beat people, it was about, and, you know, you can't compete against people in terms of running courses. But I wanted some self-respect to going, you know, I want to be as good as these people. Cool. So what your like biggest lessons then as a coach and how to like facilitate things or yeah. how to coach people and deal with like the things that how to, like, asking difficult questions kind of get the most out of someone like how did you learn that skill slowly i think i mean i've i read or listen to quite a lot of stuff i've been on a few courses i've learned a lot from watching other facilitators i think that being willing to ask the difficult question is really important and there have been some situations where i have asked a question being quite sure that it would lead to me not being engaged with that client again but i think you've got to be honest and you've got to say what you think and you've got to ask the right questions i think straightforwardness and honesty are pretty important and yeah our job of a coach of a facilitator is to make people aware of what's happening either what they're doing or the other stuff that's going on around them and sometimes that means people learn stuff they don't they didn't think they wanted to hear but if you've got more information, you can be, be, make better decisions. So having an ability to ask good questions and the courage to ask them sometimes, I think, is quite important. I've certainly learned a lot about that, like doing the podcast. And it's been quite useful sometimes I get people that I maybe don't want to interview that much. But because I'm not so bothered, I'll be a bit more ballsy to just ask some difficult questions. And it ends up making it like a really good interview, even though I wasn't expecting anything. Whereas if it's someone yeah. like I know really well and is famous, I'm a bit like, a, <laughs> it's yeah. a bit harder to be like really cool about it. Okay, so where do you see the field of coaching in general going you know, like in five years time do you think there's going to be a bit of a shift in the way people do it and like what businesses are focusing on to get the most so i think 20 years ago no one 
was coached in a business environment. 15 years ago, it started to grow. 10 years ago, it was going absolutely berserk. I think that now, if companies are paying for coaching, they want it to be far, far more business focused. And they've got to be very, very clear business outcomes. I think businesses have been through phases of trying to teach staff internally to be, to coach individuals better. And I'm not sure how successful that's been. I think being a, as a manager or a leader, having a certain coaching capability is good. I think there's a huge move to learning being more computer based. There are also things you can learn digitally. And when it comes to people skills, there's got to be human interaction. So I think coaching and kind of learning and development, I think more of it will become digital, but there is still a massive need for human interaction. But it's got to be more closely tied into businesses and they've got to know they're getting good return on investment. Are you guys working to deliver more digital stuff and to deliver more like specific outcomes from your face-to-face work? So digital, we're going to look at in the second half of 2020. Looked at it a couple of times and we're going to have another look. And we are really outcome-led and we will continue to be so and we will work to measure it even more effectively. I think that teaching somebody some leadership skills is totally pointless unless they have the opportunity to actually do something with it. I think Mm -hmm. people are so busy at the moment. Skills for the sake of it, no one uses. So actually, it's got to be tied into your specific situation. So the application bit of learning is, I I think, is critical. Yeah, definitely. Knowledge for the sake of it is lovely. People ask you, like, what's the best book to read? And you're like, well, what are you doing right now? Because if you read the right book at the right time, it's like, insane but if you read like just for knowledge and it's not appropriate it's just pointless you don't do anything with it and, and knowledge for the sake of it in some situations might be useful but in terms of a corporate development thing knowledge has got to be specific it's got to be totally applicable so we spend huge amounts of time with people working on how are you going to apply it and it's kind of the understand practice apply bit you know if you want to learn about bullshit filters or bounce back ability you know, i can yeah. teach you all areas you need to know in five minutes but that doesn't mean you can do bullshit filters. It doesn't mean you can do resilience. It means you might have some knowledge about it. And actually, the only thing that matters is being able to do it. So all our theory is really simple theory to try and give people the maximum opportunity to apply it. Can you explain what they are quickly? Or <laughs> um, Bullshit filters. So Focus is really important, but there are so many things that distract us. People telling us, oh, we can do, you should do this, you should do that, yeah. There are so many different distractions. And when I was rowing, we came up with this thing about bullshit filters, about kind of these imaginary ear defenders. You can whack them up to maximum deflection, and the bullshit just wouldn't get through. So when people were telling us that we couldn't do it, that we weren't good enough at that, we weren't strong enough, we couldn't do this, it was bullshit. It just wouldn't get through. We wouldn't listen. Effectively, we'd be going, la, 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 I'm not listening to you. Because it wasn't, if the goal was about boat speed, people telling us we couldn't do it wasn't going to help us achieve that. Therefore, we didn't want to listen to them. So as in like having a really good mission statement would be a bullshit filter if you always go back to a mission statement going, hey, is this going to make the company get to this? And it, if you're like, oh, no, then it's a distraction. Then, then it's a distraction. Therefore, I'm not going to engage with it. I'm not going to listen to you telling me that I can't do it. If you're going, you know, I think you need to work on this or this or this, or you've got these weaknesses. Now, that's helpful information that will help me achieve it. But if you're just telling me I'm rubbish, that's just not helpful. So that's bullshit filters. Stuff invariably will go wrong at various times. How do you make sure you get back on it as soon as you possibly can, and start performing. Because if you're deflated, demotivated, pissed off, frustrated, feeling lethargic and flat, you're not going to be performing very well. So your results aren't going to be very good, and you're unlikely to achieve your goal. So when stuff goes wrong, how do you learn from it, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, so that you can get back on to performing well to give you a chance of getting results? And depending on how bad the setback is, will probably take different amounts of time to recover from it so you can be firing on all cylinders again. Thank you so much for Ben coming on the show. And I hope you learned as much as I did. Remember, common sense isn't common practice. What's really important is your bounce back ability because you will get knocked down, you will fail. But do you just keep on getting up? And do you have bullshit filters in place to say no to the things that are just going to distract you from what your actual goal is? Success isn't about being brilliant straight away. It's about learning how to be brilliant and how to just keep on improving as you go through life. So on that note, life is about enjoying yourself and that starts with enjoying today. So be kind to yourself and whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too.